Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this BUL International Law Group event on the use of force and international law. A topic that is very pertinent nowadays because in the situation, of course, between Ukraine and Russia, but also all over the world, we see a new tension arising between China, the US, and always the topic remains, unfortunately, in the forefront of international news. Today with us, in order to decipher the minutes of the topic, we had lecturers and academics from all over the world and places, and they're going to give us different perspectives regarding the topic. With this, we are going to provide an outlook of how the event is going to be waged. The speaker will actually unveil his statement, and then there will be a five minutes discussion between us before the next speaker continues, and then you, the audience, the people who are here with us today, and we welcome you in this webinar, have the ability and the possibility to inform us with your questions through the Q&A section. The event is being recorded, and together with us, we have also Dr. Sulo and Dr. Mardikian from the BUL from Brunel University, London, Dr. Sulo, Reader of International Law, and Dr. Mardikian, Senior Lecturer, who also, after its presentation, will have the possibility to intervene and raise their comments on the statement of the speaker. And also Dr. Conway, equally from Brunel University, London. And with no further delays, I will give the podium to the first speaker, Dr. Ioannidis. And before that, I will provide you some information on Dr. Ioannidis' route so far. He holds an LLB from the University of Athens, an LLM in international law from the University of Edinburgh, and an MA from Arizona State University, where he also taught. Moreover, he has a PhD from King's College London, from the Dixon Poon School of Law, and he has taught in the universities of Cyprus and Queen Mary University. And after all this legal route, Dr. Ranidis is also currently a lecturer in the UK, and he focuses specifically, and this is how he's going to enlighten this discussion today, on the intersection between legitimacy and the use of force. Dr. Ioannidis, we welcome you to this webinar, and we are ready to hear your words on the topic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Solomon, for having me over. Lovely to meet you, everyone. So since, um, since I'm going first, I was a last minute drop in, uh, what I will do is I will give like a very brief introduction and then plant the seed, let's say, give some reflections, some thoughts about the interconnection of legitimacy and use of force. So then it can be left for further discussion later, okay? And um, so my, my talk will be very, very, um, very short, just an introduction and then make a final point. So um, the, According to conventional uh, positive public international law, the, um, the legal grounds for the use of force are well known, right? So it is self-defense based on both custom and the UN Charter, uh, authorization for use of force based on legally binding United Nations Security Council resolutions. And, um, and also we have another ground which de derived from, uh, from international politics and then became a custom, right? anticipatory self-defense uh, in case uh, when the, um, the attack is imminent, there is no grounds for deliberation as a last resort and so on and so forth. Now, at the same time, there has been, of course, at the background, um, another customary international legal norm which em emerged, which is uh, close to the use of force is the, the principle of humanitarian intervention, right? So the typical examples would be like examples in the 60s when uh, France, for example, intervened in, um, in Belgian Congo, sorry, Belgium intervened in Belgian Congo back then in order to rescue its own citizens. So the conditions of the um, humanitarian intervention were pretty clear. It has to be um, an imminent threat of its own citizens. So the intervening state is protecting only its own citizens, not citizens of the target state. And the uh, use of force has to, uh, uh, has to be only uh, only necessary, and the, uh, it has to be 
the, the violation, let's say, of state sovereignty has to be terminated as soon as possible. So that was a very good example, a textbook example of humanitarian intervention, right? When Belgium intervened, protected its own citizens from Belgian Congo and left. Then we, uh, with the, the 90s, with the uh, NATO attack on Kosovo and former Yugoslavia, we have an expansion of the, human, of the principle of humanitarian intervention, right? Because when the US and UK attacked, they were not protecting their own citizens, but they're protecting citizens of, their, of the target state, which is exa exactly why um, this is one of the, there are many other reasons, but I'm not gonna go into it because the point here is just to express, just to get the idea across, not to uh, dwell on the, uh, the particulars. But the point is that the, because of this, ex uh, this uh, expansion, let's say of the principle of humanitarian intervention, the Kosovo report, the uh, international committee decided that the intervention was illegal, but legitimate, right? So we, we had like another, um, uh, another norm regarding the use of force emerging. And um, so the decision was like illegal but legitimate. Now you can, we can attack it, we can have a discussion whether it was legitimate or not because legitimacy is typically contrasted with legality, with legal validity, right? So in terms of pure legality of legal validity, the justification, the legal grounds for use of force are clear, self-defense, authorization for the United Nations Security Council, and uh, anticipatory self-defense to the extent that it is provided by custom and international law. But then, based on some previous custom of humanitarian intervention, we have the narrative of legitimacy as a ground for the use of force. Now, it was regarded as illegal but legitimate. So legitimacy is contrasted with legality. In that context, legitimacy was assumed to mean certain morally compelling reasons, in particular, the, uh, the avoidance of a humanitarian catastrophe, right? The protection of certain Muslim populations, and so on and so forth. So the legitimacy, morally compelling reasons was contrasted with, with legal validity, right? Um, then we come, to, um, we come later to, uh, to the uh, attack on Libya. Now, Obama had said, uh, okay, I'm gonna keep going, yeah. O Obama had said that um, Gaddafi lost legitimacy. That was used as a ground for the use of force. Now, the two points, uh, two points interest me here, which I like to point out. First of all, again, we have, le we have legitimacy being used as a justification for the use of force. So as an exception, let's say, of, st of state sovereignty, right? Again, and second point is contrasted with legal validity. Again, we don't have any, any, use, uh, any justification of use of force, which is provided by, again, public international law in, in the sense of, of legal positivists, right? It's not self-defense, it is not anticipatory self-defense, and it is not, uh, it was definitely not provided by United Nations Security Council resolutions. Now, what interests me here is this. When the former president of the United States said that Gaddafi lost legitimacy, which conception of legitimacy was being used? Now, the interesting thing about legitimacy is that it operates in different levels of abstraction, okay? So in its most vague sense, in the most abstract, abstract sense, legitimacy is, you know, a vague sense of properness, right? But the thing is that when you are deploying it as a conception, so when I say conception, I mean this necessary and sufficient conditions for legitimacy to obtain, right? What exactly do we mean? So for example, two, at least two different conceptions could be, could be meant here. The one is Gaddafi lost a democratic legitimacy. So the majority of people no longer support him, which raises the question, is that enough? Is that sufficient reason to violate state sovereignty and use uh, and uh, deploy use of force? The other conception is gross human rights violations. Okay, now again, these, when, I, when it comes to facts on the ground, if these claims are actually true, and you know we have reports on this international, that's a different that's a different issue. We're not going to dwell on the facts right now, but on legitimacy versus on legality versus legitimacy in terms of use of force, right? So my point is that legitimacy has several conceptions, which is my my PhD was focusing on that uh, legitimacy as an essentially contested concept, meaning that there are different conceptions which ascribe meaning to this concept. Right? And if it's the case that these conceptions are, can be equally well argued and equally evident, then the disagreement between the, uh, the conceptions can, uh, uh, will last forever. Right? It cannot be solved. Why? Because there is no independent argument 
to settle the disagreement between the competing concepts or conceptions. Now, in all actuality, like I said, there are different grounds. Uh, there are uh, grounds of legitimacy are used. Legitimacy is used as a ground for the use of force and violation of state sovereignty, right? So the question that arises is, again, the contour of sovereignty, as I said, the different conceptions. And two, what is the link of these narratives of legitimacy as an exception to state sovereignty for the use of force when they are not provided by, by um, customary or a convention or, or um, treaty uh, public international uh, norms. So um, this is what I, wanted, what I wanted to get across. The conceptions of legitimacy as grounds for, for the use of force exempting um, as exemptions from, uh, from state sovereignty. Um, I'm going to leave the, I'm going to leave it the rest of you to uh, to dwell on that <laughs> and I'll be happy to uh, to see what the rest of you have to say. Thank you very much Dr. Iranidis, because you raise indeed important questions, philosophical questions, but you actually show us how philosophy is not an abstract thing, but can be actually tied to actual dilemmas that we have in the field of the battlefield and the use of force, the decision whether we can actually resort to force. Here, I have also to welcome to the panel, to the event, Dr. Macmillan. Uh, he's here with us. I don't know, Dr. Macmillan, uh, can you speak? Uh, maybe your camera, we cannot see you. Solon, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, Everybody fantastic. can hear you. The event is being recorded. You are on air now. Uh, if you want to switch on the camera, it will be even better. And you can share the event at least to the audio mode uh, if you cannot switch on. I would I would love to switch on the camera. I'm, I'm afraid my technical limitations are, are hindering me a little bit, but I shall keep persevering with that. Um, okay, not, there, there are no voices in. understanding. So we have made the introductions, Dr. Milan, as you know by now. And of course, you're going to introduce to us uh, Dr. Sierosevsky and uh, Bagheri. But in the meantime, in order to comment on Dr. Sioannidis' uh, comments and statements, to open the floor, as we see people here, as I see people uh, on the panel, to start, Dr. Bagheri, any comments on Dr. Sioannidis' presentation? Any thoughts, if you have, if you want to say something on this? You are muted. Just to on me, that is a very interesting topic that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know what happened today that I was reading something that is absolutely relevant question. And so we had uh, another lecture today that we could, so again, uh, relevant. We had uh, some guests from uh, UCL today. Uh, I'm not really just any of any special I have very specific comments, but yeah, I will happy. I mean, just be happy to to discuss it later in uh, Q and A. Doctor Sierzewski, thank you. Any particular thoughts? Yeah, actually, during um, your presentation, I thought that uh, in in some ways, I think there's some contrast with the way that I understand the um, illegal but legitimate concept in the debate over humanitarian intervention. I always think about it as an ex post argument. Namely, there is some kind of humanitarian intervention. And after the fact, we think about it, whether it's legitimate or not. If I understand correctly what you're presenting, you're suggesting that le legitimacy serves as an ex ante justification for the use of force. It seems to me that almost in all cases, the states that use force in the name of humanitarian intervention will either not provide any legal justification or, or suggesting that legitimacy is sufficient to use force. They will give some type of maybe political justification or something else, or they will try to argue that it's actually legal. So uh, if uh, in some ways, I think that, that you transform the notion of legitimacy to uh, an ex ante justification of the use of force. And, and it's interesting, I need to think about it a bit more. Initially, I, 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 my, my thought is that it, it's very different from the initial concept of I, I, illegal but legitimate. Uh, okay, you, yeah, you were muted just at the last few seconds, but <laughs> thank you, that was very, that was very useful. Well, the initial, I mean, the initial concept of understanding, the initial conception of legitimacy comes from, you know, Plato and political legitimacy and so on and so forth. That's just a justification for the use of coercive force. Um, I agree with you that in many attempts, you see the, the attempt of using the language of international law. So the intervening states tend to assume or try to persuade to convince that they are 
that, that they are using a legally valid reason, right? So that would be the US, for example, the US attack in the Middle East, right? They tried to use a justification that, oh, actually it's legally valid. Why? Well, we are interpreting two different United Nations Security Council resolutions. And from that interpretation, we infer the right to use force, which, and we, even though it's crystal clear that no state has the right to interpret two different United Nations Security Council resolution, presumably only the UNSC would have that authority. So I do agree with you that uh, when states intervene, they try to convince, right? Uh, that uh, they try to use in international legal, uh, the language of international law, they try to convince that they have legal grounds to do so. Uh, when it comes to ex post, um, sorry, but that's on the legal grounds. In terms of legitimacy, um, I don't think that, I don't believe that legitimacy is either an, merely an ex ante or ex post facto uh, justification. It can be used that way, it can be used uh, at either point in time, but I do not believe that the concept of legitimacy per se is temporarily restricted. I think, I mean, I don't want to dwell on this, but I believe that in order to meaningfully discuss legitimacy, there has to be at least room, at least a substantial room for a substantive leg legitimacy. I don't believe that there could be uh, 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 arguments made for a merely procedural legitimacy because then it defaults to other, to other concepts. So assuming that there is conceptual room for substantive legitimacy, regardless of which conception you choose, human rights or democracy or whatever it is that in your opinion renders an action or an entity illegitimate, right? Uh, then it seems to me that that is neutral to the temporal element. But understand that what you're saying might have to do with how the concept of legitimacy has been used in international politics, right? So did the Kosovo report, for example, so that, that, that you're raising a very good point. Did the Kosovo uh, report, for example, come before or after the bombings, right? Before or after the intervention? So I understand that what you're saying that as a matter of fact, legitimacy may be used before or after an attack. But um, my understanding of legitimacy is that it's a concept which may, may, be, may lend, this, lend itself to different conceptions, either democratic legitimacy or human rights or whatever, but it's not limited to a temporal element, regardless of how, of how are we gonna use it as a matter of fact. So I keep these two conceptually distinct. Thank you very much, Dr. Ioannidis. To go now to our colleagues in Brunel University, London, and starting with Dr. Sulo, our reader. Uh, Dr. Sulo, any thoughts, any comments? if there are regarding the particular statement. And of course, yes, Dr. McMillan will go afterwards and will give you also the floor to continue the event. Uh, maybe Dr. Silo, before you continue, Dr. McMillan, maybe because he raised his hands. Uh, Dr. McMillan, you want to say something? Oh, well, 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 thank you. I mean, I'm happy to wait to, uh, after Dr. Silo. Yes, of course. Of course. The... Yeah, yeah. So we can have this round of uh, talks. No, 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 yes, Dr. Please, Sulo. Okay. Um, th well, thank you very much. Um, my apologies for <laughs> arriving late and being being cameraless. Um, with regard to so Dr. Anidis, I don't disagree with anything that you've said, and I think it's a very, very interesting theme. Um, as a non-lawyer, I'm reflecting from my memory of debates about Kosovo at the time, and, and this um, rather problematic juxtaposition of legality and legitimacy. Problematic in the sense that for the reasons that you specify, then it's open to abuse. Um, I, I, my, my recollection of Kosovo is that there was perhaps enough there for it to pass a threshold, which might on balance mean that in this case, there was something substantive in the legitimacy claim. And the factors here, as I recall, was that um, the, the uh, intrinsic problem with attaining legality, because a UN resolution, the Security Council resolution was always going to be vetoed by Russia on that question. So then it becomes a genuine problem of if we can't secure the gold standard of Security Council resolution, what might count? And, and in this regard, I seem to recall that a Russian proposal at the time met very little support within the General Assembly. Um, there was a General Assembly resolution that was broadly permissive or supportive of, of some form of action, and also that it was conducted by a regional organization 
um, we should have certain authority in, in international law. So I, I wonder, I mean, assuming my recollection is, is correct, I wonder if in each case, there might be a cumulative body of factors that, that might push us over to what we might think is a, is, is a threshold of legitimacy. Well, you're very right to frame the uh, issue like, uh, like this, and you also, you also contextualize it to the, um, to the attack in Kosovo. I mean, I mentioned that as an example, to be honest, but it was a good example, nevertheless. Um, the thing with the threshold of like, you know, if, if, uh, if circumstances are up to this, you have a substantive threshold, and if we pass the threshold, then we allow legitimacy to, to succumb legality. Um, my issue with that is that, well, arbitrariness can kick in in both ways. So for, for the same reason why the United Nations, the, the, legal, the legal means that positive public international law provides, in this case, the United Nations Security Council resolution, for the same reason why they don't function, in this case, um, China, Russia, perhaps even China would like veto it, uh, for similar reasons, we would have issues attaining, um, this ascertaining, deciding whether we have reached the threshold or not. Uh, because these things have, I mean, just like we had the, the, uh, the uh, uh, we had these narratives being abused in the US UK attack, the NATO attack on Kosovo, we had similar, uh, we had similar abuse in the, um, in the Middle East, right? As I said before, the, the, the justification for the wars in the Middle East was like hardly, hardly convincing. Um, so whenever you're going to have this gray area of morality overcoming law, if there's a threshold, we will allow exception to state sovereignty, there will always be issues. My main concern though, is what would be the legal means with which we justify such a thing, right? Legal but uh, illegal but legitimate is itself not a legal justification. So in terms of law, how do you justify uh, leg even legitimate use of force when there is no legal, um, when there is no legal ground for it? So that's the one. Uh, that's the uh, that's the one issue where I think public international law has has work to do. Uh, as regards the threshold, I think that will inevitably come to the, to the specifics. But as I said, but as I said, I'm raising concerns again about ar uh, the arbitrariness. And the last point is um, again, which conceptions of legitimacy will be regarded as enough to violate to violate uh, state sovereignty? That relates to the threshold that you raised. Right, because what is going to be the threshold? Human rights violations, and which human rights exactly? Right, and so on and so forth. Or is democratic legitimacy? If there are no human rights violations, is democratic the absence of democratic legitimacy enough? Does it pass the threshold to in order to uh, to authorize for use of force? In the in the case of Gaddafi, it seemed that it did. As I said, it was unclear because Obama didn't specify any conception. I think it was intentionally vague. It seemed to do so. If you detach yourself from that context, or you take Ivo Gaddafi out of context, it could be absurd for most people to think that losing a government, losing democratic legitimacy is enough, is sufficient to justify immediately a full-blown use of force on behalf of the international community, right? So is the threshold that would be appropriate, legitimate, if you will, in one context could be entirely illegitimate to the other. So these are my concerns, but I think as but I think you framed it very well in terms of like the uh, the uh, the attack in Kosovo. You you framed it very well. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Sulo, Please. Uh, thank you, Yanidis, uh, for your inspiring uh, presentation. I'm curious uh, um, about knowing a little bit more about the this category of legitimacy. Whether you are in your studies in your research currently mapping the borders of legitimacy, you're saying that uh, uh, basically there is a legitimate intervention and use of force to avoid a humanitarian catastrophe, which of course uh, helps us to understand also the contour, the borders of legitimacy. And if you think that in state practice, in contemporary state practice, this cate category could replace uh, legality sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was both very interesting questions. So my research, and that was my uh, my PhD, was about is on legitimacy as a concept, which is something broader. So that's one thing. And the state practice about uh, legitimate use of force is another. So the first issue, um, I believe that first of all, I make a trichotomy. That was, um, I mean, um, Kenneth does that in the uh, 
uh, Applebaum. That I'm, I'm following. I agree with Applebaum on this point from uh, Kennedy uh, Kennedy School at Harvard. So there's a distinction between the word, the concept, and the um, and the conception. Right? Le legitimacy is just a word. The point is which concept we're deploying with, uh, with, with this word. That's, a one, that's one distinction. And the other is a conception. So legitimacy in its most abstract sense, let's forget law for a minute, in its most abstract sense is, as I said before, a vague sense of properness. So you have expressions like, you know, a legitimate daughter, they used to say before, which a legitimate marriage, right? A legitimate child, a child that comes from marriage, right? That's just a vague sense of properness. So it seems to me that the right way to understand legitimacy is, let's say, a trichotomy, a pyramid with three levels. On the top, you have the most abstract sense, a legitimate argument, a legitimate, right, an appropriate argument. On the second level, it's something more concrete, is where legitimacy has a subject. What is legitimate? An argument, and so on and so forth. In the context of, of this conversation, uh, in the context of law, well, legitimacy is linked with four objects four different four different categories can be legitimate the one is entities so a legitimate state uh, you can say north korea is a state but it's an illegitimate state right an entity an action such as use of force an attack and so on and so forth or a law a law that is legally valid but is grossly immoral you could say it's illegitimate think of you know the nazi laws there were laws there were established by, by legally valid order, they were applied by the courts, they were treated as all the other laws, but some of them were obviously grossly uh, immoral, unethical, right? And the other one is a legal order. So these are the four category types that can be object to legitimacy. They answer the question, what is legitimate? So the first, I repeat, on the top of the pyramid, you have legitimacy in the most abstract sense. On the second, you have what can be legitimate, the objects of legitimacy, and in this case, in, in to the extent that the conversation relates to law, we have the four category types, an entity, legal order, action. And the final, at the bottom of the pyramid, you have the conception. So as I said before, it's the necessary and sufficient conditions for legitimacy to obtain. One conception of legitimacy, so in your view, it could be democratic legitimacy. So in your view, it could be the case that an action or a state, whatever, is legitimate to the extent that it supports a democratic legitimacy supports popular sovereignty, right? So if Gandhi is supported by the majority of the people, is uh, 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 supported by the majority of the people, we should not, uh, we should not uh, uh, use the use of force, even if there are human rights violations or the other way around. Another conception of legitimacy, again, necessary and sufficient conditions for legitimacy to obtain could be human rights. I don't care if there is uh, who has, who enjoys a majority rule, but if there are gross, if there are, um, gross violation of fundamental, of fundamental human rights, we are going in. That's another conception, right? Vicana, for example, talks about that a lot. So this is, in my understanding, the best way to understand, uh, to conceptualize legitimacy. From that point onward, it seems to me that there are certain other commitments, conceptual commitments, but I'm not going to get into that because I don't want to dwell on it too much. Uh, but it seems to me that if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, you have to accept that in the absence of an independent argument, legitimacy is going to be essentially contested. Why? Because unlike, unlike validity, right? It is not a self-contained concept. It is open to whatever substantive moral reasons you regard are past the threshold or whatever, are compelling enough in order to, uh, to use use of force, right? And different people may argue eternally about these things. In the absence of an independent argument to settle the, the dispute between different conceptions, you have an essentially contested concept. So what we regard right, whatever threshold we regard right now as being enough in order to pass the legitimacy test and authorize a morally justified at least use of force, 50 years later, you could be saying the same, you could be saying exactly the opposite. That's exactly why one of the commitments that I make is moral objectivism, but uh, I don't want to dwell on that. So this is to, so to answer you the first part of your question is how I conceptualize a legitimacy in a trichotomy from the most abstract to the most specific and an essentially contested concept because they are equally with a, there can be equally well argued conceptions. Now, when it comes to how it's been used in uh, in in practice, sorry if I miss out on something on the on the part of the second question you asked. So feel free to have a follow up. Uh, it seems to me that it's been used with an intentional or unintentional properness. It's one of the terms. It's one of the terms just like democracy, which because they have a positive connotation. When you want to intervene, <laughs> that's like doing international politics, you throw it out, you expect no response, and automatically you expect it to moralize, to legitimize your action. 
Think of the US attack in the Middle East. So the George Bush administration had used a rather confusing, Tony Blair was a little bit more clear, I think. I'm not saying I agree with either, but the narrative they used, the, the, uh, the Bush administration was a little bit confusing. We are invading for democracy, legitimacy, every positive word was in there, right? So it seems to me that there's intentional lack of clarity and this, the words I use in order to simply justify, uh, justify the action. I'm going to self I'm going to deploy the concept of legitimacy. So you cannot argue against because what are you going to say? Illegitimate, that makes you sound bad, right? So it seems to me that we have to be very clear. And that's why I'm very sympathetic to John's previous comment because he says, I want a threshold. That would totally make sense because then you can, because at least that could, even if the threshold is arbitrary, you could at least reduce the arbitrary use of the term in the international legal realm. But it seems to me that the practice has been uh, rather uh, inconsistent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ioannidis. Dr. Sulo, any further comments you want? So just to ask also our senior lecturers, Dr. Mavdikian and Dr. Conway, if they have a comment, question brief to proceed also with uh, Dr. Sereshevsky. Uh, so any comments, uh, Dr. Mavdikian or Dr. Conway? If I, if I could ask a brief question uh, well, first of all thank you for the talk your talk was brief but um it was a very good overview of the uh, you have an important issue in rhetoric and in the way um international actions can be justified and how legality can be maybe circumvented um by using this vague idea of, of legitimacy um i want to ask you a specific question about the libyan example um do you think that it, the intervention was framed around what President Obama said, the idea of legitimacy? Um, for example, France intervened as well. How did France um, justify its role? And you, you think that it was a deliberately vague um, claim, perhaps, that the US administration made at the time? Um, I'm sure the US administration is well advised in international law. Do you think the US wanted to spark off a possible expansion of the ground of intervention or do you think that was a one-off incident and that maybe it was just President Obama who decided to say that and maybe didn't represent any kind of broader long-term kind of policy about that? Yeah, thank you. Well, the first part of your question has to do with the specifics with the facts on the ground. I didn't focus on that because the issue here is generally legitimacy versus use of force, not Libya in particular. I would just mention as an example. And yeah, you're absolutely right that you know what I said was not like the whole was not the whole picture. And my apologies if I painted it as such. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean France, uh, France was into it. I think with the the actual um, the actual drone that executed uh, Gaddafi. I mean, I think I think either the drone or the or the fighter. One of them was NATO. The other one was French. So it was obviously a combined movement. Even again, they had no authorization to execute Gaddafi as such. Um, so yeah, you're you're absolutely right to uh, to imply that you know this statement of Obama was not like the full the full justification for uh, for the intervention. Definitely. Um, now, if it was a, if it was a one off thing or if it's a general narrative. Um, look, I mean, in terms of Libya, there have been other other claims as well. I'm just focus, I, I just chose to focus on this one. If they're going, if it's going to be used later, um, I think I think it is a general thing. When I say general thing, I don't mean about Libya. I think that there is a general tendency of using legitimacy. It's not the only reason. Sometimes you have strict um, stipulations of uh, you know of human rights atrocities as such, right? Um, but I think after you know after the incidents in Rwanda with the international community not convening, you started talking about the humanitarian intervention. I think after uh, after that, I think legitimacy came into play. So I'm not saying that every single you know use of force is going to be justified in that, but it was not a one-off thing either. It came into play with the with the NATO attack in in, in Kosovo. It was mentioned again in Libya. Um, it was it, I think so. It seems to me that there is a trend. Again, it's not the only justification. But it's one of those terms that are used, not the only one, but it's one of the terms that costs that are used in order to create military narratives, to create narratives of military interventions. And it seems to me that if you want to, I mean, brute force is brute force, obviously, but if you want to be more reflective and try to uh, be more cautious about these narratives that are used, or at least break down these narratives, then you can prevent uh, such, uh, such inter interventions. So how could that be done? Well. The issue is this, if you understand legitimacy is essentially contested, that when you hear the claim in international community that 
this regime is illegitimate and therefore I'm deploying use of force. You, you can have a response to that because so far we don't, it seems to me that we don't have a sort of response. And the response is this, wait a minute, which exactly, which exact conception are you deploying here? And why is it that, as John was saying, why is that it passes this or that threshold? If you don't reflect on that, if you don't look at the specifics, if you don't push the, push the question of which conception is being used, then legitimacy might, might, might continue being thrown you know, in, the, uh, in these narratives in order to justify um, justify military interventions. But I do take your claim that, you know, this is not the only, the legitimacy itself doesn't paint the full picture. That's why before I said that we have to link it with exceptions from statehood. How is it that this or that conception of legitimacy or other justifications comes to be an exception from statehood in order to have the authority to intervene? Thank you very much, Dr. Yanni. This is very clear. And along these lines, we're going to go to the second speaker, Dr. Shevsky. And I'm going to pass also the battle now to Dr. Macmillan, the chair of this event. Dr. Macmillan, you can introduce for us Dr. Sereshevsky, and of course, after wage the discussion with the statements that are going to follow Dr. Sereshevsky's presentation. Thank you very much, Solon. Um, yes, a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Yali Sherevsky, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Haifa Law School. Uh, previously, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Federman Cybersecurity Research Center, the Minerva Center for Rule of Law under Extreme Conditions, and a Grotius Research Scholar at the University of Michigan Law School. Yali specializes in international law, specifically international humanitarian law, international law making, international legal theory, war and technology, and international criminal law. Uh, professionally, he is also clerked for the Honourable Deputy Chief Justice Elisa Rivlin of the Supreme Court of Israel, and has published in a whole host of leading journals, including the European Journal of International Law, the Virginia Journal of International Law, the Michigan Journal of International Law, and the Journal of International Criminal Justice. I'm very pleased to welcome Yali to our discussion. So, uh... Hello everyone, great to be here. And when I was asked to present something about Yusad Bellum, I asked what is the specific subject? And, and I was told that it's open-ended. So I took the offer to freely choose what I want to discuss and I hope that it was the right decision, both because apparently it was a surprise that I'm not going to talk about uh, technology or cyber. And also since it's the first time in which I present an idea. No, not a draft paper or work in progress, but just an initial idea. So you can understand that I'm a bit nervous about it, but also <laughs> excited to hear what you have to say about it. And my tentative title for this presentation or the idea is Common Sense International Law or Common Sense Use of Force. It focuses on the limits of the current doctrinal discussion and specifically it focuses on the use of force against non-state actors. So we all know that Article 24 of the UN Charter formally regulates only the use of force by states against other states. And this led to continuous doctrinal debate over the regulation of the use of force between states and non-state actors. And the main problem that international law scholars had to solve in this regard <laughs> is that the formal doctrine here seems to contrast strong intuition about the need to regulate the use of force even when states use force against non-state actors, such as in cases of internal conflicts or extraterritorial use of force against NSAs. In other words, it's hard to think that it's permissible to use force arbitrarily in these settings. I will not go into detail about the various positions in the debate, maybe just to give one example, there are recent attempts, uh, for example, by Eliav Lidlich and others to regulate such conflict through human rights law or other venues. But here I want to offer a more radical position. And according to this position, when an action is clearly wrong, when it's extremely hard to think of so someone that will protect such a position, it is also prohibited under international law. And in our case, I want to suggest that the arbitrary use of force against non-state actors is prohibited under international law. Think, for example, of 
a state that attacks an NSA for no reason whatsoever. And from a doctrinal perspective, I tend to think that this should be regarded as prohibited under customary international law of the use of force. And if time will allow, I will try to explain this position. It's important to note that in most cases, there are other easier ways to suggest that the use of force in such cases violates international law. So for example, arbitrary use of force in internal conflicts will almost always violate international human rights. Therefore, in these cases, the need for, the, for rules that rely on the use of force is less significant. In the extraterritorial context, in most cases, the state that uses force against the NSA operates in the territory of another state, and therefore Article 2.4 is part of the legal framework, right? at least when it comes to the other state. However, there are some rare cases in which the main question or the only question is indeed the use of force against NSAs, at least from the point of view of the state that uses force. So think, for example, of the use of force by Israel in Gaza in recent years. And think about it from the Israeli legal position, not from the way that the, uh, most of the world or many actors perceive it. In these cases, according to the Israeli position on international law, Gaza is not occupied, it's not a state, and human rights law does not apply extraterritorially. So what are we left with, right? Ostensibly, there was no reason for Israel to justify its use of force at all. And it could have focused exclusively on IHL issues, for example. However, we see that Israel continuously tries to justify its use of force in Gaza, in ways that resemble the charter regime. For example, in the Israeli report on the 2009 conflict, it stated that, and I quote here, a state's right to self-defense extend beyond the text by other states. Even before the UN charter, customary international law recognized the right of self-defense against non-state actors, such as armed group launching attacks of significant scale and scope, end of quote. And this quote demonstrates the relevance of the prohibition on the use of force, even in pure state versus non-state actor context. And this brings me back to the doctrinal issue. Some authors suggested that there is no customary prohibition on the use of force in such cases, mainly focused on internal context, internal conflicts, and this is because when looking at the normative discussion around these cases and stakes position, most of these positions focused on other uh, international law rules such as human rights, rather than focusing on the use of force. My position on the matter is different. It makes sense that when that when having alternatives, the discussion will focus on positions that are easier to defend doctrinally, such as human rights. But a, but think about the analysis of the Israeli case. And I think that in these cases, the analysis of the question of customary law, a, a, when we have strong intuitions about the right, a, way to uh, behave, when we have a common sense understanding of what, uh, that it is not allowed, the doctrinal analysis or the methodology of looking at customer international law should be different. It should focus on the lack of permissive positions in contrast on focusing on positions that explicitly recognize the customary norm. If there is not even one case that a state clearly said that it can just use force at will, in such context, then we should read into it a, con a customary prohibition to use force. And my position here regarding the use of force could clearly be extended beyond issues of use of force. So think, for example, on the debate over the extraterritorial application of human rights. Can we really think that it is permissible under human rights law for state A to kill a child in state B with no reason at all under the current legal doctrine, right? So when we focus on the on the doctrine of, right, the uh, state agent doctrine or effective control concept, we miss something very basic about these prohibitions and the way that we 
a, a, have a common sense about what international law does in these situations. But since here we focus exclusively on the use of force, I will end here. And I want to thank you again for inviting me and I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you ever so much, Dr. Shereshevsky. Thank you for those, those very interesting reflections. Um, I'd like to open the floor if uh, colleagues, law colleagues have questions. I have an initial question, Dr. Macmillan, for Dr. Shereshevsky. And uh, because the issue of uh, Gaza was being brought uh, as a case study, the question is, uh, we are talking, first of all, Dr. Shereshevsky, I agree with you that uh, when we're talking about non-state actors, there is no reason why illegality should not also be applied the way we apply when we have attacks against states. But in the case of Gaza, we had also the missile attacks. So Israel was exercising, or oh, this was the Israeli argument now, it was exercising its right to self-defense. Along these lines, we know after September 11 that the right to self-defense exists against non-state actors. So why is this case being brought in order to bust your uh, argument? The right, so we have the broad debate about the extraterritorial use of force against uh, uh, non state actors that exist, right? But there, right, the we tend to skip the question of what is the problem here, right? What is the initial problem? And the initial problem is a violation of Article 2 4. The uh, violation of Article 2 4 is only possible according to regular doctrine if it if this use of force is against the state so right so for example if the us attacks in pakistan it violates article 24 or when it comes to pakistan right so we have a problem then we need to justify it we need to we talk about uh, the unwilling unable or whatever right so we have an initial problem but what happens if you don't have state B at all, if it happens in the high seas, right? If it happens somewhere else and the use of force is against non-state actors or internal use of force, right? So at least ostensibly you don't have a problem here because there is no violation of Article 2.4. There's no state B and it is allowed. So the question of self-defense is not even relevant because the state that uses force against this non-state actor does not violate does not violate international law and this is why i think that the gaza example is a great example because according to israel palestine is not a state so why do they need even to justify this use of force because they're not violating article 24 because they do not use force on the territory of another state but we see here that, as you said, they do suggest that it, it is being done in self-defense, which I argue suggests that in these pure scenarios, we can see that states do not think that they have just an a, a ability to use arbitrarily a, a force against non-state actors, but actually they believe that they must have a justification for such uses of force. And, and, the, and we should read into it a customary prohibition on the use of force even a, a, against non-state actors, regardless of the existence of state B. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Um, <clears throat> can, can, can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, yeah, th thank you for the um, for the discussion. It it's uh, again it's very, raises a very um, significant general issue. It also arises in um, domestic public law about the difference between a, an express legal basis or permission uh, or an or express prohibition and just a, a legal silence. Um, and there's this there's a sort of marginal debate in UK public law about whether the government can do anything that is not expressly prohibited or whether the government must act on an express legal basis. And there's not much support for the view that it can do, you know, anything that's not expressly expressly prohibited. But it's it's not actually a settled 
it's, it's a general view and there's some case law suggesting that you know suggesting kind of flexibility with it and so i, I think it's an interesting way to formulate the question or to formulate the issue in international law to say that um if there's no rule in favor of it well then there is an implied prohibition um so yeah i just think it's a general um, issue in 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 um in public law and in, in legal theory maybe that's not that's not often um expressed and maybe as much as much as it could be just to take the example of the um article and the more specific point about article 2-4 um kind of just on, on a sort of an ordinary common sense interpretation of it it's it's about the exercise of sorry about the exercise of force by states not necessarily on specifically on the territory of another state but just any exercise by a state of force external to its own borders so for example the use of force in the high seas um would be um included in article 24 so so let me start with the second question i think that the common interpretation or maybe even there is a consensus or, uh, that the use of force in article 24 is against a state right so right so if you use force in the high seas but against another state then clearly it's within the the scope of the of the article but if you use it against a non-state actor if another state is not involved then right it's not part of, of article 24 and as to your uh, the first issue i think that this is a, a great point and i think that traditionally there is a, a, a clear difference between domestic law and international law in this regard. In, in, in public law, right, in domestic law in Israel, as you say, in the UK, and I think that in most cases, the government is only allowed to do what is clearly stipulated in the law, right? right? They have, they have a a capacity that does not extend beyond what it's explicitly can do according to the law. And, but in international law, at least traditionally, it's the other way around. If something is not prohibited under international law, then at least under international law, right? As long as there are no prohibitions under domestic law, the states can do, are free to do whatever they want. And, and, a, and you are right that I suggest that in, in this type of context, that there is a very strong intuition regarding uh, 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 these issues, we should uh, flip this assumption and think that uh, uh, if there's a silence, it does not mean that these uh, actions are allowed, but rather that they are prohibited unless states explicitly suggest that they can act in this specific way. Thank you very much. Um, Gerard, do you want to come back on that or we'll leave it at that? Yeah, um, but, well, just very briefly. Yeah, thank you for the answer. I think it's, um, yeah, yeah you, you've, you've, you've raised, you've expressed well the kind of follow-on issues or the or the, the questions that, that that are there and yeah this issue in international law that states have whether they have unlimited jurisdiction um but I, I wonder does that extend to anything for example in the lotus case it was specifically about criminal jurisdiction i wonder does the idea in the lotus case extend to the actions of states absolutely or in some very general sense um but I, I don't know the answer to it but i think yeah i think you've expressed well the the how the issue arises in international law thank you very much um any further comments or questions we can go dr mcmillan maybe to the next speakers unless dr Yanis wants to say something and also to remind here just our audience after dr Yanis unmutes himself to remind our audience that they can also submit their questions to the Q&A section after Dr. Bagheri, we're going to be able to answer also these questions. Yes. I forget to unmute myself. The question is, is it early signs of Alzheimer's and I keep forgetting or am I doing it intentionally for entertainment purposes? Sometimes I wonder myself. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Solon for the, letting me know. So um, a quick question, 
and that's just like more for my for my own purposes. Um, it's a, it seems to be a crucial aspect seems to be whether we're, the entity is a state or non-state actor, right? But you know, you 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 played the argument very well depending on how the other state perceives it to be. So Israel perceives it as a state or non-state entity, Palestine and so forth. My question is, how exactly does it cut through the argument the the necessity, if any, for objective determination of whether it's a state or non-state entity, right? How exactly would that fit in? I do not think that that it, um, it makes a, a huge difference in for my argument because, because my argument try right to make to suggest that the law is to a large extent uh, equal in both cases, right? So so I think right. So the prohibition applies both to state and non-state actors. But I, I want to make clear uh, what I suggest why I. A, a focus on the way that the state perceives the situation, because it does not matter for the law at all. It matters only uh, uh, for the evidence of what states think that the law is in this type of situations, right? Because as I said, much of the resistance for seeing, uh, for for recognizing a customary law prohibition on the use of force against non-state actors, is because the uh, legal reactions or, or positions were based on other rules of international law rather than on the use of force. So, for example, when in, when we have a civil war and the government kills uh, the opposition then you can hear that it violates the, the right to life rather than violates the use of force. So what I said here is, is that here we have a case where there's no other international legal ground for prohibiting the use of force. If the state that uses force does not think that there is another state, does not think that human rights law applies to this issue, and does not think that there is an occupation, then what is the legal basis for the need to justify the use of force? It can only be its position on the use of force. And, and so this is how I try to demonstrate that we have actually evidence, at least in some cases, and moreover, right, the evidence that we have is from a state that is usually highly criticized for its mm. international opposition. So even if a state that usually is perceived as a state that has problematic international legal position actually states a more um, a, a restrictive position on the ability to use force, it's actually need to strengthen even more the notion that there actually is a legal a, a, a prohibition that is based on the use of force in this type of context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's no further questions, then we move on. Going, going, gone. Okay, so a, a pleasure now to introduce Dr. Saeed Bagheri. Sorry, and, and thank you, Dr. Shirosevsky. Uh, I forgot to say thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation and exchange that followed that. Um, let me now introduce Dr. Saeed Bagheri, who is lecturer in international law at the University of Reading. Uh, prior to joining Reading, he was a Max Weber postdoctoral fellow at the European University Institute where he worked on a project on the legal validity of the use of force against armed non-state actors. Uh, Saeed researches in the areas of the law of the use of force, international humanitarian law, peace building and post-conflict justice. And one of the themes that he works with in particular are the contradictions in the application of the, of the law on the use of force and international humanitarian law. Recently, he's published a volume uh, with Hart Publishing Oxford on international law and the war with Islamic State, challenges for use 
and Bellum and Yus in Bellow. He's had visiting positions at Cambridge, UCL, Leiden, and was formerly assistant professor at Actinis University from 2015 to 2017. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Saeed Aguera. Well, thanks very much, Dr. McMillian. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to join this, uh, the excellent and, and of course timely event. And thanks again for inviting me. Uh, and when uh, Dr. Solomon just contacted me, and I was uh, exactly like Dr. Cherevsky, uh, I, I was just thinking that what really interests me to, to, to delve into in this in a short notice. Uh, so uh, I just decided to talk about again uh, something like uh, uh, what I mean just pre was presented by uh, Dr. Shrevsky about non-state actors, uh, but uh, of course from uh, uh, particularly you know just very specific uh, or let's say from different uh, perspectives. So in the just 10-12 uh, minutes, let me just uh, uh, again just to share that I'm going to talk about uh, non-state actors, but. I will try to address something, something uh, about treaty-based uh, justifications uh, for military interventions uh, in foreign territories uh, against non-state actors, uh, which directly focuses on, uh, on the source and validity of the territorial state's consent uh, to intervention and, of course, the use of armed force in their territory. Uh, so there are perhaps you know that there are prominent uh, examples of uh, bilateral security and uh, de defense uh, treaties that have authorized external uh, military intervention accompanied by uh, actual consent at the time. Uh, for example, uh, the bilateral defense treaties like the Treaty uh, of Friendship between Iran and Soviet Union, uh, which was signed in 1921. Uh, uh, and the treaty between the U.S. and Cuba, uh, so-called Platt Amendment in 90 or uh, three. Uh, but in my uh, case that I'm uh, trying to share with you today, uh, as a very recent uh, example, I consider uh, Turkey's justifications for military intervention um, and the use of force uh, against non-state actors uh, based in Syria uh, and in particular, I argue that uh, the military intervention in northern Syria justified under the bilateral uh, security agreement signed between Turkey and uh, Syria in uh, 1998. Well, let me start with uh, a, a very quick background leading up to bilateral treaties between Turkey and Syria. Uh, following the, uh, the security uh, agreement uh, between Turkey and Syria, the contracting parties uh, clearly made a joint commitment to, to cooperate in combating terrorism. Uh, and according uh, to this agreement, uh, and based on uh, the principle of reciprocity, uh, Syria, as one of the contracting parties, just, uh, just uh, I mean, uh, accepted that, that would not permit any activity with uh, which uh, emanates from his territory aimed at uh, threatening uh, the national security of Turkey. Uh, and in the meantime, it would not allow the supply of weapons, uh, logistical uh, material, financial support, or uh, any propaganda activities or violent uh, non-state actors on uh, the territory of uh, Syria. Uh, well, essentially the, the parties, uh, I mean, Turkey and uh, Syria, uh, they agreed upon an account of terrorism uh, strategy, uh, but the problem is that the Syrian government has not really been effective enough in, in applying uh, uh, and implementing the major terms and uh, conditions of the security agreement. Uh, and it was the reason that uh, uh, both parties, Turkey and Syria, they reopened discussions and signed another uh, treaty uh, and uh, so, so they actually they revised uh, the, the security agreement. So the new uh, agreement, so-called joint cooperation agreement, and they signed that uh, in 2010, uh, which uh, just shortly before the rise of Islamic State. Uh, uh, so under this new uh, agreement, each party uh, will take uh, effective security measures against terrorist acts and 
uh, members of terrorist uh, groups and violent non-state actors uh, in their uh, territory. So uh, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I uh, consider these bilateral treaties as uh, primary justifications for uh, using force against non-state actors. Uh, basically, my research just try to uh, trying to understand that what the legality or, or let's say there's just rationality is behind that. Uh, far more recently, uh, uh, I'm sure uh, many of you just remember that just following uh, the rise of Islamic State in northern Syria. Uh, so Turkey was one of the uh, the most, uh, let's say, the Germans in the, uh, the, the, uh, the victims of, uh, the most important victims of these conflicts, just because uh, it's a neighbor to, to Syria and they have, you know, just their, their uh, sharing border. So the uh, uh, Turkish government, they sent a letter to the UN Security Council in 2019 and saying that uh, the bilateral security agreement signed uh, between Turkey and Syria uh, constitutes a contractual basis uh, for Turkey uh, to fight all kinds of uh, terrorism uh, emanating from uh, Syrian territory in uh, an effective and timely manner. Uh, well. Uh, the letter was the reason that actually I was a start, I, I just started to, to analyze this agreement to just try to, uh, to understand that what, what the agreement is really about. Uh, so all my findings are, are built on the fact that the agreement uh, uh, regulations are not really you know uh, sufficient to justify the use of force in Syrian territory without the consent of the Syrian government uh, because. Um, the agreement does not authorize military intervention. It purely provides uh, just uh, cooperation, joint cooperation uh, in the fight against terrorist organizations, uh, including the PKK uh, um, and these extensions like YPG in Syria, as well as any other uh, violent non-state actors based in Syria, which one of the most important exa examples is the uh, Islamic State. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, both treaties uh, provide that the contracting parties will never uh, allow um, any uh, terrorist or other uh, violent uh, non-state actors to use uh, their territory to violate uh, their national security and stability. Uh, and the contracting parties will take necessary joint measures uh, to to certain degree by identifying their uh, resources and locations. Uh, I mean, uh, in a sense, uh, what I will say is that it seems to me that uh, consent to take all necessary measures uh, to pursue uh, 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 non-state uh, non actors um, uh, in an independent is 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 an independent justification uh, for Turkish government to use extraterritorial uh, force against uh, such groups by. Uh, but, but but again, but the problem is that nothing is in these two uh, different uh, treaties uh, addresses military intervention or uh, safety zone or, or unilateral invasion or occupation of an outer contracting parties uh, territory. Um, well, in the meantime, it doesn't even uh, seem to to have been uh, the intention of the contracting parties at the time of negotiations. Uh, well. What is clear uh, in this case uh, is that the bilateral agreements in question uh, do not authorize the use of force on the territory of the contracting parties. And so intervention in Syria uh, is an approach that stems from the broad interpretation of uh, the key provisions of uh, uh, those bilateral treaties, uh, according to which the contracting parties just uh, have uh, agreed to take uh, necessary measures for certain purposes. Uh, again, uh, I would argue that uh, uh, the only the clear consent of a state uh, to put to a particular uh, act of armed force, uh, uh, if freely and uh, uh, properly given, uh, can legitimize military intervention, which otherwise uh, would have been a violation of a general uh, prohibition on the use of force. Um, and further to this, uh, state practice clearly indicates that uh, although the use of force based on bilateral defense or security treaties uh, is one of the primary circumstances that may justify uh, forcible uh, intervention, uh, the intervening state uh, is also prohibited 
from taking any action in violation of uh, the traditional rules of international law uh, that have been developed for the protection, uh, for the purpose of the, the, the protection of territory and integrity of the states. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, but I, I will say that even consent uh, of the territorial states does not preclude uh, the wrongfulness of any act of the state which is not in conformity with uh, the obligation uh, uh, arising under a uh, Kogan's norm of general international law. So uh, but, but as, as mentioned earlier, uh, there are factual examples of uh, bilateral defense or uh, uh, security treaties, authorizing military interventions accompanied by ad hoc consent. Uh, however, uh, uh, the case that I'm uh, discussing in my uh, uh, presentation is a convincing example of how bilateral defense or security treaties might potentially be abused and used for serious uh, violations. Uh, so we just need to recall that uh, the gender prohibition on the use of force contained in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter is a, is, is a use cogger as, as, as was discussed before me, uh, um, uh, which, which, uh, from, from which no derogation is permitted, uh, uh, either by consent or by a treaty. And of course, uh, use Congress norms do not render uh, any invalid bilateral defense or security uh, treaties. But the thing is that uh, the prospective unauthorized military intervention in foreign territories is a decisive issue that would bring the international responsibility of the intervening state uh, for violating the applicable rules of international law, in particular, the law on the use of force. Uh, and this is uh, quite relevant to, to the case that I'm, I'm talking about, the Turkish uh, uh, treaty-based military intervention, because uh, the main objective of the security uh, agreements between Turkey and Syria was just to repel the advance of violent non-state actors from their borders so they can no longer threaten their national security. And uh, the agreements uh, in question confine uh, any conceivable necessary uh, security measures to uh, an area five kilometer, as I remember, uh, into Syrian territory. In the case, uh, the, uh, if, if the Syrian government you know, just failed to take necessary measures by itself. So uh, again, uh, this is what basically, uh, as I mean, just was discussed by then that treaties, but the problem is again, is that Turkish troops had already repelled the non-state actors by seizing control of uh, 35 kilometers, which is, uh, Again, uh, remember that I said that uh, what was uh, I mean, just regulated by the treaty is just maximum five kilometer. Uh, but in practice, Turkish uh, troops, uh, you know, they seized control of uh, 35 uh, kilometer of Syrian territory. And worse still, uh, they continue to exist within the territory of uh, Syria, uh, even after the fall of Islamic State. So um, uh, this is other issue that I, uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, to to argue in my uh, presentation, or so in this and later my research that uh, you know they that continued presence in Syrian territory is just uh, an extension of treaty-based intervention that would be uh, considered a violation of Syria's territorial integrity, uh, which is also against the primary objective of the, uh, uh, the bilateral treaties uh, and of course the law on the use of force in particular. Uh, so uh, ultimately, my concluding point is that uh, the broad interpretation of bilateral defense or security uh, treaties uh, would invite a stronger states to intervene uh, by treaty in the affairs of the relatively weaker states. And it would also lead to uh, a state's own assessment uh, of a particular uh, situation as uh, an armed aggression in violation of principles of the law uh, uh, on the use of force and in, 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 in particular uh, the UN Charter and of course the customary rules of international law. Uh, well, that's all from me. I would stop here and uh, I would be very happy uh, to discuss it later. Thank you very much, Saeed. Um, any questions or comments? Yeah, I would like to ask Said first of all, thanks for the presentation. You spoke about consent being invalidated by any military, uh, any military agreements, and the consent actually doesn't sanction the intervention. 
because the intervention you said is based on Article 2 of the UN Charter that also Dr. Cherezevsky mentioned before, and the sovereignty of the nation. But my question is, consent is not also a facet of sovereignty. Maybe you go too far, because I can agree with you that if we have an abuse of the initial power, of the initial actually ambit of the agreements, indeed, there is something to discuss about. But should we go so far as to say that consent to intervene cannot be sustained in all cases because it violates the sovereignty? Because also consent is a facet of sovereignty. Yeah, that's a very good question. But the thing is that, again, even in international law, this is what is, you know, basically in my uh, teaching as well, I'm trying to, to tell my students as well that international law is the law of consent. So, for, for, I mean, the state members of the UN, even, you, I mean, as a, as a state uh, a member of the UN, you are free to, to ratify, to accept an international treaty or to reject that. So, uh, unless you have a consent to do something, right? Uh, so again, uh, in use of force, uh, which is relevant to the uh, the, the principle of uh, respect for territorial integrity and also the principle of refrain from, uh, you know, uh, using force or let's say the intervening in internal external affairs of a state. Uh, so this is, I mean, there is just one exception again, uh, even if when it comes to the use of force. Uh, so the case that I'm discussing the bilateral treaty is just, it is, I think this is very, it's a good example to say that something like a, a collective self-defense, you know, but not under the UN Security Council. So there are security or defense, uh, or let's say, the, 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 the treaties that they said, okay, we uh, we are just, you know, just going to do to, to make some necessary measures that if there is a conflict coming from your country or the, conflict, the, the attack that is coming from my country against your territory integrity. So this is what they've done, what they have done before. I mean, the Syrian government and Turkey. But the problem again, uh, as I said in my last uh, point that uh, the Turkish government that had, you know, self-assessment, you know, they, they said for their own assessment of the interpretation that they use for other different uh, objectives, like because perhaps you know that. So when, if, if uh, any international lawyers who are working on non-state actors, I, I'm sure they know that uh, the, there is a problem within uh, Turkish government and also the PKK members. Uh, so the Turkish government for many years, they have tried to pursue these members of, or let's say just fighters of the PKK, it, uh, both in Northern Syria and Iraq. And, and, and they don't need any, any consent from the government, right? Because they already know that this is just using force against these uh, non-state actors. Uh, but in the meantime, again, when it comes to these bilateral treaties, the Syrian government has, has already accepted that there is a conflict between Turkish government and the Kurdish fighters. So they, that's the reason that they have already accepted uh, and they, uh, they, they clearly they, they put their the consent that if there is a threat to their national security, they can take necessary measures. But the problem is, again, as I said, the Turkish government, uh, just after the rise of Islamic State, uh, they try to use this treaty as a justification. Uh, so in practice, they, they were talking about the use of force against non-state actors as a general, let's say as it's a topic, uh, but, but they also using force uh, against the Turkish, sorry, the Kurdish fighters in Northern Syria, just under that treaty. So just briefly, if I can follow up uh, the answer. So do you agree that consent to intervene if Syria gives a consent, Turkey can intervene legally, legitimately, as Dr. Yanidi said before, of course, on a limited basis. If Turkey abuses this discretion, it's another story, but uh, prima facie, can Turkey do such a thing or not? Not really, that's what I'm saying, you know, uh, because it's also relevant to uh, the imminent attacks in international law, because basically what Turkish government in, in its letters to the, said to the UN Security Council, basically is about an Im imminent attacks. There is no any actual, let's say, a factual attack against Turkish uh, security, uh, national security. And that's why in uh, 2019, there was another letter sent by the Syrian government uh, to the uh, Security Council, just saying that Turkey has occupied several Syrian uh, villages um, and this military aggression against the Syrian people continued unabated. Thank you, fascinating. Thank you, Saeed Solon. Uh, Yali. Yeah, uh, thanks. And I, I tend to agree with uh, all of your position, I, but I wonder how 
far do you go? So do you object any type of bilateral treaty as a justification if it does not also include a specific consent? Uh, re so let's assume that we have a, a treaty that is not as vague as the treaty that you discussed, but explicitly say something like state B can intervene in the territory of state A in this type of circumstances. Does it change the picture or do we have still uh, strong reasons to assume that we will need a specific consent right before the intervention? For me, I, I have an intuition that I will have problem even with this scenario, but I'm not sure that I can clearly state in my opposition right away. Well, thanks, thanks, Iha. Uh, well, yeah, this was a very good question. Again, uh, just quite relevant. Uh, but to make it, uh, uh, I mean, to bring some clarity to this argument, again, uh, uh, I was trying to tell you that in this presentation that we just need to be careful when reading into, I mean, international treaties. So it's a matter of interpretation. Again, this is what Turkish government, you know, just interpreted and, and find something about that treaty because uh, it takes me, you know, one year, uh, just was trying to understand what this agreement is about. It's just very short with some, you know, five or six articles. It's a very short. Uh, it is very, you know, it's a good example, like uh, uh, Brian Kellogg, which is a very short uh, international treaty. Uh, but again, I was trying to, to make sure that there is an, uh, you know, justification or there is an authorization of military intervention uh, to the other contracting parties' territory. But the thing is that no, there is no any word that, you know, or any regulation that authorizes uh, one of the contracting parties, Turkey or Syria, to, to, uh, to military, I mean, to military intervention. Uh, what is clear in this treaty and the second one, which is a revision, is just taking necessary joint measures. So that's what I'm th saying that the Turkish uh, government's justification is that uh, uh, Syrian government was not really effective, which is also very good example and closer to the unwilling or un unable uh, theory that, you know, just introduced by the uh, US government. Uh, but in the meantime, again, and after that, uh, you know, oppositions are coming from the Syrian government in their last letter to the UN Security Council. So the Turkish government, they immediately, they, they changed their position. Uh, and after that treaty, they just started to talk about unwilling theory. So that's what I'm trying to say that in this research that no, uh, unfortunately, there is no need clear. Uh, I mean, the word that just uh, referring to military intervention, just a joint cooperation. Maybe, maybe just a follow up. So I agree that this is a case where it's an abuse of the interpretation of the treaty, but I don't think that all uh, interpretations are the same or that, that there are in, inherent vagueness in any legal term or that it's impossible to understand the treaty terms in all cases. And, and so my question was, regardless of the specific issue between uh, Syria and Turkey, and, and the PKK, what will be your position if the treaty is actually clear, right? So if we can create a clear treaty that explicitly allows the use of force of one state in another state's territory, would you, in, in such a case, uh, um, agree that there is no need to specific consent outside of the treaty? Or even in such a case, when it's co completely clear what the treaty says, we will still demand the state to provide an explicit consent before. The no, that, that's, that's, I mean, uh, but I totally agree. I totally agree because what I said, it, there's a bilateral treaties. Uh, so treaties, again, as I said, is just a matter of consent. So if there is a clear, you know, regulations or, or any provision that is allowing to, uh, allowing the parties to use force, uh, so whatever the reason is, uh, so it's a clear consent. Well, explicitly in treaty, they're saying that, okay, do you have right to use force, even if the territorial state is not really effective, right, to take some measures. Uh, but again, uh, uh, this is just a matter for treaty, just to say that, okay, if there is a regulation in treaty. Thank you both very much. Um, any further questions?
Dr. Milan, we have one question from the audience. I don't think we as participants have further questions. We have one question if from the audience. I don't know if it's relevant though. We can read it maybe. Dr. Milan, you can read it and if the panelists can address it, it's about the ISIS sums. So maybe you'd like to read it and to see if somebody wants to address it. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't see the question anywhere. I mean, so so I will take the lead here. We'll read it briefly the question for the information of all. My inquiry says it comes from the audience from uh, Afro Al Matari. My inquiry relates to the sons of ISIS who have recently been born. There are a lot of newborns daily in detained camps in Iraq, Syria, and other regions. Under what law are they included or judged or should be treated? Iraq or international law or what? Or are they homo sacer? This is how she defines the question. The mm -hmm. question that has to do with nationality, though, not with the use of force. I don't know if it's relevant because Dr. Bagheri spoke about ISIS. Maybe the participant got a bit carried away. If somebody knows the answer, because again, it's not the expertise of the panelists, he can take step and give an answer. Well, before before the other uh, the panelists, uh, I would just say that I had a paper that very recently was published with one, one of my colleagues that I co-authored with uh, Professor Alison Bisse was published in a Journal of Conflict and Security Law with exactly the same topic that there is a the repatriation of the uh, children of Islamic State. So um, my mistake here. So the participant is correct here. So to give credit to the participant, yes, please, Dr. Bagi. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, again, the, 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 I mean, uh, the answer to this question is about the repatriation of children of uh, Islamic State. Uh, they were born in, in, in Syria or the children who uh, were brought by their families uh, to Syria. And uh, of course, this is, is a matter for national law. And, and of course, it is in the international law. But the thing is that I discuss in that paper is that, uh, again, it's just coming from the justifications by uh, territorial states uh, like the national security, because uh, they have already, you know, they've seen these children uh, as, as as a threat to their national security. But but what, what is basically is discussed on the international law is that even we have too many different cases in the European Court of Human Rights that are saying that, okay, the state members, they need to repatriate this. But again, uh, this is one of the challenging uh, issues that I, I'm not really in a right position to say that, okay, they need to have, they need to, to have these people again in their territories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I guess with the discussion, um, the number of papers, but certainly the Saeed's, then coming from the area of international relations, I, I find myself quite torn in a way um, in terms of finding a perspective or a position of judgment or perspective, if you like, on this. Because on the one hand, then in international relations, because of the the influence of realism uh, as a perspective which emphasizes power. I think we uh, tend to be very uh, blasé or dismissive about the sorts of important questions that, that Said is identifying here, because we, I think we tend to say, oh, well, power trumps law, um, utility over norms, you know, this sort of attitude. Um, but I, I guess the other side of that coin is I'm, from my awareness of how, my limited awareness of how international law discourse operates, there is a sort of a high level of discourse here. What, what would you hope to come from, how would you see your argument operating uh, in terms of its potential impact? Not necessarily immediately, but in the longer term perhaps. How do these arguments operate in the legal, normative, or political spheres. And it, perhaps I should give an example, because I don't want to leave it too abstract. But if we come back to Kosovo, then one of the arguments that backfired against the United States was that when Russia claimed its intervention, you know, in, in, in Crimea uh, justified its intervention, then it was on similar grounds. You know, it's, it might not be legal, but we claim legitimacy, we're defending our, our kin, our peoples. So I can see there how law, legal, law arguments operate, but I'd be very interested to hear a, a view from, from lawyers on this. Any other uh, panelists would start to tackle on this? Sorry, Said. 
Okay, no, no, no problem. Just maybe for very shortly, and then I'll, I'll give to the, I mean, the floor to other my, my colleagues. Uh, so, uh, my, uh, I would say, as a general um, answer, is that uh, so we, this is this is just the United Nations Security Council that needs to to amend itself, uh, because as you said, uh, some of the, uh, I mean, uh, one of the problems in international law, particularly in the implementation of the contemporary rules of international law, is just. Uh, I mean, this is very relevant to the politics as well, because uh, as you said, Russia, an example, is a very, very timely and is a very good example. Uh, again, from the use of force against non-state actors in Syria, I remember that for more than 14 resolutions when uh, the United Nations uh, Security Council were trying you know, to, to accept a resolution to allow the international community to use force against the Syrian government, but Russia... Uh, Russian Federation, they, they blocked by, by the right veto, they blocked these resolutions. Uh, uh, but, but in the meantime, and again, when we just return back to, uh, to invasion, uh, just uh, think about what happened in Iraq or Afghanistan, right? Even at that time, Security Council was not really effective to take some necessary measures just to say that okay, this is a legal uh, you know, operation or, not, or, or, or illegal operation. But today, again, uh, we have some uh, relevant examples. Russia used force against, you know, Crimea, used force against Ukraine, and the international community is still just waiting because there is no any, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, active uh, uh, reaction from the international community. Uh, I'm sure you remember that what happened a few months ago that when they annexed some regions, again, Russia was on the panel. Uh, you know, they again just voted the resolution from the uh, international, uh, uh, I mean, the, the UN Security Council. Uh, but again, this is also one of the questions that my students, uh, so, you know, in uh, one of the foundations of international law module, one of the students are asking that, okay, we know that uh, international law is not really work in practice, you know, is uh, Russian Federation is regularly just they, they're blocking the uh, the, the international law. So then, what we, why, what, for what reason? Why do you think that we need to study law? Uh, but, but I would say that no, just we need to be optimistic because uh, we cannot say that there is no international law just because of the powerful states. Uh, this is a big problem. This is a big challenge. Uh, but I just hope again, uh, this is the Security Council uh, and and of course the General Assembly as a, as a time for you know uh, international meetings that they need to amend itself. So just a few um, clarifications, uh, if I may, though. So, okay, I mean, the, the base of the question go back to, you know, go back, sorry, goes back to um, arbitrariness, and, you know, the arbitrary use of these narratives and so on and so forth, so, and the misuse and so on and so forth, so we discussed that. Um, but just a few clarifications. So, for example, realism, right, that, oh, you know, uh, power trumps law and so on and so forth. Well, I think we just have to be reflective and careful on the kind of claims uh, we make, right? So brute power operates on a factual basis, you know, states A invades states B, uh, state B. Law is a deontological real, right? So law doesn't tell you what is going to happen or what is happening. Law tells us what ought to happen. So power trumping law, I mean, that's that, that, has, that has always been the case, law itself, is a legal order, is a system of rules. System of rules themselves cannot possibly stop reality. In domestic legal order, this is exactly why you have a central mechanism which enforces rules, whether that is the government, the police, and so on and so forth. So in international law, you always have power trumping law because you don't have a central enforcement mechanism. Right? So we, we have need to be reflected that all these things we're saying, we should not expect, you know, the only thing you can do is at least address the narratives so that we don't so that we don't have the certain narratives of military intervention being arbitrarily used and the international community approaching them with some kind of hastiness, right? A lack of reflection and so on and so forth. Political motivations are always going to be in place. Law itself cannot cannot take away the political motivations for, for one or, or the other action. But what you can do is clarify the narrative so there's more reflection and you can, can break them down. Now, the issue of you know, how they're gonna be used, how you can stop brute power, and this real, uh, the realism that was mentioned before, well, that has to do with um, central enforcement mechanism, which itself can become tyrannical. And we should address that as an intrinsic issue of the international, international legal order as such, 
not all, not merely de facto, uh, not merely issues of de facto cases. That's just a clarification I wanted to make. Thank you very much, Dr. Verani. This Dr. Macmillan, just also to remind to all the attendees, we've gone a bit beyond the time. We have a second question also from the audience, maybe to address also that question, and then we can wrap up the event and thank the participants and renew our appointment, our rendezvous for the next time. So the second question is, what in a case, if the government of a particular country is held by an illegal organization, for example, paramilitary organization, would be a military intervention from another state considered a humanitarian intervention or an international conflict. So once again, country held by a paramilitary organization, a state intervenes, is that intervention, a military intervention, a humanitarian intervention or an international conflict? This is how the question is being framed, although it's a bit different international conflicts we have in all cases, but our panelists will clarify the notion for the questioner. So whoever wants to take the lead. Uh, Dr. Sereshevsky, you want maybe to take the lead? Yeah, sure. I, I think that um, it, it depends, right? So, maybe two things. First, I don't think that the type of government is usually being used as a justification for humanitarian intervention. We have lots of governments in the world that it doesn't necessarily have to be a power military organization or whatever that are the legit legitimacy using the terms that have been um, discussed earlier is at least questionable, but the, I think that the mainstream positions regarding humanitarian intervention, and I refer to the uh, positions that actually support it as, a, as <clears throat> a legal justification for the use of force, usually focus on mass atrocities and see things along these lines to justify intervention rather than just the uh, form of the government. And But let me, and maybe say something about about a, a Professor McMillan's question, because I, I think that, right, it goes back to core criticism uh, of international law, but I, I do think that that uh, the, the notion of power itself should be understood in a more nuanced way uh, uh, today. The, and, and when it comes to international law, Right. If we just adopt the traditional approach to power, you would, you would ask yourself, why do powerful states even bother to discuss international law, right? So if, if the rational actors, they should just do whatever they want. They don't even need to provide justification. But we see that all um, actors, including the most powerful states, such as China, the US and others, they all invest much resources in providing uh, international legal arguments for their actions. And I think that it's at least suggests that there is some value even from a realist perspective for a, a international law investment. And in to, to some extent, I think that um, the notion of power, at least when it comes to international law has shifted, at least in some cases, to the ability to use uh, resources to influence the uh, major discussions regarding international law. So if you think about IHL, for example, or the use of force, you see that the US, the UK, and other states, maybe Israel, use tremendous resources in order to influence the way that we think, for example, about the extraterritorial use of force against uh, non-state actors. And this is how we should understand power. So it's not only the ability to act in these states with right to, to intervene, but also the ability to shape international law. And if you, you think, for example, about China, you see that they invest tremendous resources, again, uh, in shaping the way that we think, for example, about the law of the sea when it comes to the uh, uh, South China Sea arbitration. So I think that even from the IR perspective, not the IL perspective, legal arguments and resources that relate to this type of arguments are really significant from this perspective as well. 
Thank you very much. Perhaps I should just come back briefly on that. In the the in the field of IR is far broader than than realism, um, and I think that the I'm very very heartened, encouraged, inspired by the responses that you gave, and this sense of a almost quasi-autonomous public realm of discourse, justification, legitimacy. And, and it is worth remembering as well that the United States did pay a, a price in terms of its reputation for its invasion of Iraq on such threadbare claims. So even for the most powerful, you know, the, the, the rhetorical arguments do make a difference. And, and I think its leadership and credibility suffered because of that. Um, Solon, are, are we winding up or? Yes, Dr. McMillan, we can wrap up the event. We can thank the participants and the audience who actually asked interesting questions. Mm -hmm. We renew the meeting with the BUL International Law Group for our next event, which is going to take place. So stay tuned with us. The video will be uploaded on YouTube, on Brunel Law School YouTube page. And along these lines, to wish everybody a pleasant evening. And of course, to thank Dr. McMillan for the wonderful chairing of the event. Well. Th thank you all very much. It's been an enormously interesting and educational uh, opportunity for me too. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.